Okay. Uh, the Book of Three, Chapter Four, the Gwythanes. <clears throat> Gwythanes? Yeah. Melangar bore them swiftly through the fringe of trees lining Great Avern's sloping banks. They dismounted and hurried on foot in the direction Gurgi had indicated. Near a jagged rock, Gwydion halted and gave a cry of triumph. In a patch of clay, Henwen's tracks showed as plainly as if they had been carved. "'Good for Gurgi!' exclaimed Gwydion. "'I hope he enjoys his crunchings and munchings. "'Had I known he would guide us so well, I would have given him an extra share.' "'Yes, she crossed here,' he went on. "'And we shall do the same.' Gwydion led Melangar forward. The air had suddenly grown cold and heavy. The restless avern ran gray, slashed with white streaks. Clutching Melangar's saddle horn, Terran stepped gingerly from the bank. Gwydion strode directly into the water. Terran, thinking it easier to get wet a little at a time, hung back as much as he could, until Melangar lunged ahead, carrying him with her. His feet sought the river bottom. He stumbled and splashed while icy waves swirled up to his neck. The current grew stronger, coiling like a gray serpent around Terran's legs. The bottom dropped away sharply. Terran lost his footing and found himself wildly dancing over nothing as if the river as the river seized him greedily. Melangar began to swim, her strong legs keeping her afloat and in motion, but the current swung her around. She collided with Terran and forced him under the water. Let go of the saddle, Gwydion shouted above the torrent. Swim clear of her! Water flooded Terran's ears and nostrils. With every gasp, the river poured into his lungs. Gwydion struck out after him, soon overtook him, seized him by the hair, and drew him toward the shallows. He heaved the dripping, coughing Terran onto the bank. Melangar, reaching shore a little further upstream, trotted down to join them. Gwydion looked sharply at Terran. I told you to swim clear. Are all assistant pig keepers deaf as well as stubborn? I don't know how to swim, Terran cried, his teeth chattering violently. Then why did you not say so before we started to cross? Gwydion asked angrily. I was sure I could learn, Terran protested, as soon as I came to do it. If Melangar hadn't sat on me, you must learn to answer for your own folly, said Gwydion. As for Melangar, she is wiser now than you could ever hope to become, even should you live to be a man which seems more and more unlikely. Gwydion swung into the saddle and pulled up the soaked, bedraggled Terran. Melangar's hoofs clicked over the stones. Terran, snuffling and shivering, looked toward the waiting hills. High against the blue, three winged shapes wheeled and glided. Gwydion, whose eyes were everywhere at once, caught sight of them instantly. Gwythanks! he cried, and turned Melangar sharply to the right. The abrupt change of direction in Melangar's heaving burst of speed threw Terran off balance. His legs flew up, and he landed flat on the pebble-strewn bank. Gwydion reined in Melangar immediately. While Terran struggled to his feet, Gwydion seized him like a sack of meal and hauled him up to Melangar's back. The Gwythanes, which, at a distance, had seemed no more than dry leaves in the wind, grew larger and larger as they plunged toward horse and riders. Downward they swooped their great black wings driving them ever faster. Melangar clattered up the riverbank. The Gwythaint screamed above. At the line of trees, Gwydion thrust Terran from the saddle and leaped down. Dragging him along, Gwydion dropped on the earth under an oak tree's spreading branches. The glittering wings beat against the foliage. Terran glimpsed curving beaks and talons merciless as daggers. He cried out in terror and hid his face, as the Gwythanes veered off and swooped again, the leaves rattled in their wake. The creature swung upward, hung poised against the sky for an instant, then climbed swiftly and sped westward. White-faced and trembling, Terran ventured to raise his head. Gwydion strode to the riverbank and stood watching the Gwythanes' flight. Terran made his way to his companion's side. I had hoped this would not happen, Gwydion said. His face was dark and grave. Thus far, I have been able to avoid them. Terran said nothing. He had clumsily fallen off Melangar at the moment when speed counted the most. At the oak, he had behaved like a child. He waited for Gwydion's reprimand, but the warrior's green eyes followed the dark specks. Sooner or later, they would have found us, Gwydion said. 
They are Aaron's spies and messengers, the eyes of Anuvin, they're called. No one stays long hidden from them. We are lucky they were only scouting and not on a blood hunt. He turned away as the Gwythanes at last disappeared. Now they fly to their iron cages in Anuvin, he said. Aaron himself will have news of us before this day ends. He will not be idle. If only they hadn't seen us, Taryn moaned. There is no use regretting what has happened, said Gwydion, as I set out again. One way or another, Aaron would have learned of us. I have no doubt he knew the moment I rode from Caedathil. The Gwythanes are not his only servants. I think they must be the worst, said Taryn, quickening his pace to keep up with Gwydion. Far from it, Gwydion said. The errand of the Gwythanes is less to kill than to bring information. For generations they have been trained in this. Aaron understands their language, and they are in his power from the moment they leave the egg. Nevertheless, they are creatures of flesh and blood, and a sword can answer them. There are others to whom a sword means nothing, Gwydion said, among them the cauldron-born, who serve Aaron as warriors. Are they not men? Taryn asked. They were once, replied Gwydion. They are the dead, whose bodies Aaron steals from their resting places in the long barrows. It is said he steeps them in a cauldron to give them life again, if it can be called life. Like death, they are forever silent, and their only thought is to bring others to the same bondage. Aaron keeps them as his gods in Anuvin, for their power wanes the longer and farther they be from their master. Yet from time to time, Aaron sends certain of them outside Anuvin to perform his most ruthless tasks. These cauldron-born are utterly without mercy or pity, Gwydion continued, for Aaron has worked still greater evil upon them. He has destroyed their remembrance of themselves as living men. They have no memory of tears or laughter or sorrow or loving kindness. Among all Aaron's deeds, this is one of the cruelest. After much searching, Gwydion discovered Henwen's tracks once more. They led over a barren field, then to a shallow ravine. Here they stop, he said, frowning. Even on stony ground there should be some trace, but I can see nothing. Slowly and painstakingly, he quartered the land on either side of the ravine. The weary and discouraged Terran could barely force himself to put one foot in front of the other, and was glad the dusk obliged Gwydion to halt. Gwydion tethered Melangar in a thicket. Terran sank to the ground and rested his head in his hands. She has disappeared too completely, said Gwydion, bringing provisions from the saddlebag. Many things could have happened. Time is too short to ponder each one. What can we do then? Taryn asked fearfully. Is there no way to find her? The surest search is not always the shortest, said Gwydion, and we may need help of other hands before it is done. There is an ancient dweller in the foothills of Eagle Mountains. His name is Medwin, and it is said he understands the hearts and ways of every creature in Prydain. He, if anyone, should know where and when may be hiding. If we could find him... Taryn began. You are right in saying if, Gwydion answered. I have never seen him. Others have sought him and failed. We should, o we should have only faint hope, but that is better than none at all. A wind had risen, whispering among the black clusters of trees. From a distance came the lonely baying of hounds. Gwydion sat upright, tense as a bowstring. Is it the Horn King? cried Taryn. Has he followed us this closely? Gwydion shook his head. No hounds bell like those, save the pack of Gwyn the hunter. And so, he mused, Gwyn too rides abroad. Another of Aaron's servants? asked Taran, his voice betraying his anxiety. Gwyn owes allegiance to a lord unknown even to me, Gwydion answered, and one perhaps greater than Aaron. Gwyn the hunter rides alone with his dogs, and where he rides, slaughter follows. He has foreknowledge of death and battle and watches from afar, marking the fall of warriors. Above the cry of the pack rose the long, clear notes of a hunting horn. Flung across the sky, the sound pierced Terran's breast like a cold blade of terror. Yet unlike the music itself, the echoes from the hills sang less of fear than of grief. Fading, they sighed at sunlight and birds, bright mornings, warm fires, food and drink, friendship, and all good things have been lost beyond recovery. 
Gwydion laid a firm hand on Terran's brow. Gwyn's music is a warning, Gwydion said. Take it as a warning, for whatever profit that knowledge may be. But do not listen overmuch to the echoes. Others have done so, and have wandered hopeless ever since. A whinny from Melangar broke Terran's sleep. As Gwydion rose and went to her, Terran glimpsed a shadow dart behind a bush. He sat up quickly. Gwydion's back was turned. In the bright moonlight, the shadow moved again. Choking back his fear, Terran leaped to his feet and plunged into the undergrowth. Thorns tore at him. He landed on something that grappled frantically. He lashed out, seized what felt like someone's head, and an unmistakable odor of wet wolfhound assailed his nose. Gurgi! Terran cried furiously. You sneaking! The creature curled into an awkward ball as Terran began shaking him. Enough, enough! Gwydion called. Do not frighten the wits out of the poor thing. Save your own life next time, Terran retorted angrily to Gwydion while Gurgi began howling at the top of his voice. I should have known a great war leader needs no help from an assistant pig keeper. Unlike assistant pig keepers, Gwydion said gently, I scorn the help of no man. And you should know better than to jump into thorn bushes without first making sure what you will find. Save your anger for a better purpose. He hesitated and looked carefully at Terran. Why? I believe you did think my life was in danger. If I had known it was only that stupid, silly Gurgi. The fact is, you did not, Gwydion said. So I shall take the intention for the deed. You may be many other things, Terran of Kea Dalbin, but I see you are no coward. I offer you my thanks, he added, bowing deeply. And what of poor Gurgi? howled the creature. No thanks for him. Oh no, only smackings by great lords. Not even a small munching for helping find a piggy. We didn't find any piggy, Terran repri replied angrily. If you ask me, you know too much about the Horned King. I wouldn't be surprised if you'd gone and told him. No, no. The Lord of the Great Horns pursues wise, miserable Gurgi with leaping and galloping. Gurgi fears terrible smackings and whackings. He follows kindly and mighty protectors. Faithful Gurgi will not leave them. Never! And what of the Horned King? Gwydion asked quickly. Oh, very angry, whined Gurgi. Wicked lords ride with mumblings and grumblings because I cannot find a piggy. Where are they now? asked Gwydion. Not far. They cross water, but only clever, unthanked Gurgi knows where. And they light fires with fearsome blazings. Can you lead us to them? Gwydion asked. I would learn their plans. Gurgi whimpered questioningly. Crunching, crunchings and munchings? I knew he would get around to that, said Terran. Gwydion saddled Melangar, and, clinging to the shadows, they set out around the moonlit hills. Gurgi led the way, loping ahead, bent forward, his long arms dangling. They crossed one deep valley, then another, before Gurgi halted on a ridge. Below, the wide plain blazed with torches, and Terran saw a great ring of flames. Crunchings and munchings now, Gurgi suggested. Disregarding him, Gwydion motioned for them all to descend the slope. There was little need for silence. A deep, hollow drumming throbbed over the crowded plain. Horses whickered. There came the shouts of men and the clank of weapons. Gwydion crouched in the bracken, watching intently. Around the fiery circle, warriors, warriors on high stilts beat upraised swords against their shields. What are those men? Terran whispered. And the wicker baskets hanging from the posts. They are the proud walkers, Gwydion answered in a dance of battle, an ancient rite of war from the days when men were no more than savages. The baskets, another ancient custom best forgotten. But look there, Gwydion cried suddenly, the Horned King, and there, he exclaimed, pointing into the columns of horsemen, I see the banners of the Cantor of Regan, the banners of Dow Gledon and of Mar, and of the Cantors of the South. Yes, now I understand. Before Gwydion could speak again, the Horned King, bearing a torch, rode to the wicker baskets and thrust the fire into them. Flames seized the osier cages. Billows of foul smoke rose skyward. 
The warriors clashed their shields and shouted together with one voice. From the baskets rose the agonized screams of men. Terran gasped and turned away. We have seen enough, Gwydion ordered. Hurry, let us be gone from here. Dawn had broken when Gwydion halted at the edge of a barren field. Until now, he had not spoken. Even Gurgi had been silent, his eyes round with terror. This is a part of what I have journeyed so far to learn, Gwydion said. His face was grim and pale. Aaron now dares try force of arms, with the Horned King as his war leader. The Horned King has raised a mighty host, and they will march against us. The Sons of Dawn are ill-prepared for so powerful an enemy. They must be warned. I must return to Kaer Dathil immediately. From a corner of woodland, five mounted warriors cluttered and cantered into the field. Terran sprang up. The first horseman spurred his mount to a gallop. Mel Melangar whinnied shrilly. The warriors drew their swords.